Hi, welcome to the Jewish Policy Center webinar series. I am Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the JPC and your host. Today, I am starting with a disclaimer. I've never done that before, but I need to do it today. The Jewish Policy Center has stayed out of the judicial reform debate in Israel and the demonstrations that accompanied it. We have criticized the Biden administration and the American media for their blatant interference in the domestic affairs of a democratic allied country. Israel is quite able to make decisions for itself and deal with the consequences. However, the issue that was reported as the quote, refusal of the IDF reservists to report for duty in some large numbers was extremely troubling to us uh, as strong supporters of the US-Israel relationship. You know where we come from, you know where we've got, we're, we're going. And <clears throat> today our guest, David Weinberg, is the right person to talk about what is happening with the IDF and the intersection between IDF, media, it, and the US in democratic countries. So I'm gonna give you the short form of the JPC commercial, and then I'm gonna turn the floor over to David. The Jewish Policy Center is a 501c3 organization established in 1985 to provide perspectives and analysis of foreign and domestic policies by leading scholars, academics, and commentators. You can find all of our work on our website, jewishpolicycenter.org. That's jewishpolicycenter.org. And that includes prior webinars and including a great prior webinar with David Weinberg. We support a strong American defense capability, U.S.-Israel security cooperation, and missile defense. We support the legitimacy and security of Israel against anyone who would deny them. And we support the right and authority of the democratically elected government of Israel to determine the parameters of its own institutions. As you know, we sit slightly to the right of center, and that gives us a great interest in things like small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, energy security, free speech, and intellectual diversity. In this series of calls, we have hit everything from China and Taiwan, we're going back to China next week, folks, to Iran, to Russia and Ukraine, to Armenia and Azerbaijan, to Turkey, the Gulf states, NATO and US defense spending, as well as the Supreme Court and homeschool. Today, it's the IDF. Our guest, David Weinberg, is a government relations and foreign affairs specialist based in Israel, having made Aliyah uh, from Canada in 1990. So his English is excellent, a little Canadian, but it's excellent. He is the senior fellow at the Jerusalem-based Kohelet Forum, specializing in diplomatic and defense affairs, and a research fellow at Habit Chonistim, Israel's defense and security forum. You can read his newspaper columns at the Jerusalem Post or in Israel Hayom. He was senior advisor to then Deputy Prime Minister Natan Sharansky and the founding coordinator of the Prime Minister's Office of Global Forum uh, Against Antisemitism. He is a prominent lecturer on public affairs. He's spoken in Israel, in Canada, in the US, and in Europe. He's appeared in every media venue you think he might and been quoted by a great many international uh, publications. David knows a lot about a lot of things. So the one that surprised me when I first read his bio and we first got to know each other is that he is also an accredited expert on Israeli and kosher wines, having studied enology at the London-based Wine and Spirit Education Trust, the world's leading institute for qualifying sommeliers. In his spare time, he conducts wine and food tours in Israel and writes about kosher wine from around the world. David, if someone doesn't ask you about it, I'm going to ask you about it. But now, would you bring us up to date on what's actually happening in the streets of Israel or not happening? Um, and what various groups in Israel are asking or demanding? I did hear a report, and maybe you'll comment on this and, and maybe not, that Israeli doctors are leaving the country looking to go to the US or the UAE. Do they really think American democracy is better than Israel's or that the UAE has a democracy? I don't know. What's going on? David Weinberg, enlighten us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Shoshana. Uh, thank you for having me here. Hello to all uh, participants in this call. Uh, I'm really hope that we have time to get to talking about Israeli wine. Uh, it is a passion of mine and for good reason. And I do want to get um, directly to your question. But first, I'm going to update my bio by you. I am now 
uh, founding senior fellow at a new Jerusalem-based think tank headed by Mayor Ben Shabbat, who was national security advisor. It's the Misgav Institute for National Security and uh, Zionist Strategy. Um, I hope you'll look the Institute up and follow our social media feeds. You know, um, what in recent weeks, I've sort of labeled um, some of the uh, term, turbulence here in Israel, um, a refusal to serve festival. And by that, I mean that um, key Israeli media, especially Channel 12 television news, have become the cheerleaders in chief uh, for the political opposition. Every night they manage to discover and celebrate another announcement of a group of army reservists who are supposedly refusing to serve in the IDF. And there are two problems uh, with this much Ballyhood um, refusal to serve festival. First of all, I suspect that the uh, numbers are fuzzy and inflated. A deeper dive into the numbers indicates that very many of the purportedly AWOL uh, soldiers are long retired from active service of, of any type. And second is the fact that for every refusal to serve announcement or declaration highlighted by um, the um, media, which is fiercely opposed to Netanyahu, um, there are an equal, if not much greater number of uh, petitions and declarations out there against Sarvanut, against uh, the wave of um, avowals to refuse um, to serve. By my count, and I did my homework on this, um, well over 100,000 Israeli uh, active duty and military uh, personnel are on record um, as rejecting the calls to uh, Sarev, to refuse to serve in the IDF. But you wouldn't know this. You wouldn't know this from uh, the mainstream media uh, or really from the global media. Uh, they've almost totally ignored petitions and declarations from the center and conservative sides of the political MAC. They have refused to report on what I think is the majority consensus in Israeli society, which is that to refuse to serve in the IDF under the current circumstances and in almost all circumstances is criminal, uh, perhaps even treasonous. And in all cases, it's certainly damaging um, and dangerous. Are you uh, getting all this, uh, Shoshana? Am I coming through clearly? Okay. But as I said, if you're not a regular reader or follower of right-wing and religious Israeli media, or a follower of uh, nationalist social media feeds, you wouldn't know, for example, that two weeks ago, um, 150 very senior IDF military intelligence personnel published a public call um, against Sarvanut, a call to leave the IDF out of politics and beyond political debate, and a call on military intelligence personnel to uh, answer with enthusiasm and vigor, as they always have, all draft calls for active duty. Some of the people signing that uh, were names that should be familiar to, um, to you and many of our listeners. Uh, Major General Yaakov Amidror, who was a national security advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, Brigadier General uh, Yossi Kuperwasser, um, who was Chief of Research and Military Intelligence and Director General of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Um, these are prominent minds, but again, you wouldn't know this from reading mainstream Israeli press or the international press. Um, and they wrote that the use of the IDF and other Israeli security organizations as levers of political pressure on any Israeli government is tantamount to a silent military coup effort. This is the true threat to Israeli democracy, they wrote. It crosses all red lines of acceptable behavior. It saps the resilience of Israel and the integrity of the IDF as a true people's army. So first of all, surveying the lay of the land, I don't think we've been getting a, um, a fair picture of where things are really at in terms of um, 
the IDF's military readiness and the scope of actual uh, refusal to serve in the IDF. My concern is that whether it's five reservists who are refusing to show up for reserve duty or 500 or 5,000, and we don't know what the real numbers are, my concern is that our enemies will read the situation the wrong way, um, that Hezbollah in particular uh, will be tempted um, to test Israel's mettle at a time when they may have reason to think because of this refusal to serve festival uh, that Israel is so weakened that it won't be, that it won't withstand the test, that it won't be ready for a confrontation. Now, unfortunately, uh, my sense is, is that a significant confrontation with Hezbollah is coming, coming in the next two, three months, within the next two, three months. Hezbollah has been um, acting more boldly than ever before, certainly over the last six months, testing Israel's um, stamina um, on the northern border. They've launched uh, a dozen different provocations that range from um, laying uh, mines right up on the border to Boy Scout style tents that they've set up uh, in one place over the actual borderline, almost taunting Israel. Uh, daring Israel to 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 act against them, um, and um, there have been some infiltrations uh, from the north, both using drones as well as um, commandos. And Israel is going to need to respond to that. And I don't think it'll be pinprick style um, action. Um, so the resilience of the army and its readiness for real conflict um, may soon be tested on the northern border. Do you still, do you think, I'm going to jump right in here. Um, if there is military action between Israel and Hezbollah in the north, do you think that the reserves are ready to go? Do you feel confident that the Israeli military has, it's, I know it's two different things. One is to say, will the government order military action? The other is to say, is the IDF ready to execute? Is it ready to execute? Okay, we have to divide that question into two parts. Um, one um, is the standing army uh, ready to execute, um, and will the reserve brigades and divisions uh, show up um, to fight? The short answer to both is yes, although uh, it remains to be tested. There are no signs, there have been, um, no uh, refusals to serve in the standing army. The, the conscript army of, the, uh, of, of Israel, the IDF, um, is in the same shape it was today, six months ago. Now, you may argue that six months ago, before all this judicial reform uh, controversy began, even then the army wasn't necessarily ready for a full-scale conflict uh, with Hezbollah, never mind a conflict on, uh, in multiple theaters, on multiple fronts at the same time. And there have been some pretty damning reports uh, published by the IDF's own internal ombudsman and outside groups and a Knesset uh, Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee that suggests that um, the Army has a long way to go to being ready for real ground-to-ground -ground, um, combat against a uh, well-entrenched um, and experienced enemy um, uh, such as Hezbollah. But that hasn't you know, the situation six months ago is no different than vice versa. The situation today is no different than it was six months ago. And uh, we all want hope and believe that the IDF has been training intensively, which it has, has for a confrontation with Hezbollah. The IDF has trained in uh, the mountains of Cyprus and in the mountains of Greece. And in the old days, it used to train in the mountains of, of Turkey, all of which mimic the terrain and the fighting conditions that the IDF would face in southern Lebanon against Hezbollah. And the army um, chiefs say that they indeed are ready. If we go to a broader conflict and have to call up um, reserve um, divisions, <laughs> then we get into uh, questionable territory again. The number of people who have actually refused to serve 
have actually, um, you know, received um, draft orders and said, no, I'm not coming uh, in, in, in groups that would really affect army performance at this moment remains minuscule and I hope it'll, it'll, it'll remain that way. Um, you have to remember that um, the army will need to call up reserve units for Israel's other fronts if it's thrown into a full-scale conflict on the north. Uh, there's still um, Gaza and Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, um, to hold down tight. Um, and as you know, in recent conflicts, um, Israeli Arabs, both in the Galilee and the Negev, have started trouble um, within Israel at a time when the IDF was engaged in conflict with uh, our enemies beyond our borders, such as Hamas and Gaza. Um, so there are going to be a lot of troops needed um, to hold down other fronts, uh, to keep the roads open, uh, to keep some of the restless natives within Israel um, uh, at bay. Um, so uh, this would be a time of testing for the IDF. It would be wrong. It would be stupid. Um, for our enemies to assume that Israel has been so weakened internally by um, the internal controversies that we won't know how or be ready to fight when um, D-Day comes, uh, that would be that is that would be a misperception on their part. They would be making a mistake, and Israel will have every reason in the world to prove them wrong. You mentioned multiple fronts. Clearly, we see that Hezbollah in Lebanon is um, hot at the moment. So is the West Bank hot at the moment, Judea and Samaria. But our biggest concern here as Americans is what happens in the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, and with Iran. And the CENTCOM commander, General Carilla, has been a big fan of Israel's. Um, he keeps showing up on your doorstep. He says great things about the relationship, about working with the IDF. Um, is the American military concerned? Have you heard any concern? Have you heard people express concern that the possibility of the IDF being weakened, either by reservists who don't uh, plan to show up or simply by the politics of, of the way it looks, that the US will have concerns about how strong its ally Israel is? The short answer to your question, Shoshana, is no. I have not heard um, um, from anyone uh, indications that um, the quality of U.S.-Israel strategic partnership or even tactical military partnership has been affected thus far, or that General Correll has any reason um, to be concerned. Let me back up for a moment and um, reiterate something that you glossed over, but supremely important. The move of Israel to CENTCOM um, is, a, uh, is a strategic earthquake of the right type, of the good type. Um, it has brought um, Israel into closer coordination uh, with the United States and other Western partners, European partners, um, like never before. Uh, and indeed has led to um, much closer um, training uh, as well as intelligence sharing. And it has opened the possibility for um, greater integration of the Israeli military. Um, into the region. And we've already seen, you know, the Emirati Air Force um, participating in the same exercise along with US and the Israeli Air Force. We've seen the Bahraini Navy participating in um, exercises with US, um, Israeli, and other uh, naval forces. Um, and soon that will be true of the Moroccan uh, armed forces as well. Um, th this is a sea change. Uh, it's extraordinarily important, very beneficial, and this is a result of a Trump administration decision, as well as the Abraham um, Accords. All of it is uh, is good and moving things um, in the right direction. If there is a concern that um, the American generals may have heard about from the Israeli counterparts, it's about um, the next um, draft cycle. Uh, as you know, Israel goes through a draft cycle twice a year. 
um, and the Army and the Air Force and military intelligence rely on the draft to bring the best and brightest and strongest and brawniest um, young Israelis um, into their ranks. And um, while almost all Israelis um, have to be drafted into military or national service units of some type, uh, they don't all have to volunteer um, for the, uh, the toughest or the most strenuous um, units. And Israel hopes and assumes that uh, Israeli youth will continue to do so. Um, there's a draft uh, coming up this, this month, August. Uh, and there'll be another one um, in the wintertime. Um, if there's a significant drop off in volunteering to serve in the best units, the tough units, uh, the most uh, frontline units, that would indeed be a true warning sign. But everything I've seen indicates that's not the case. Um, the, uh, the resolute Zionism and commitment to the country of our youth remains strong. Is there, we have a question from a listener. Is there a penalty either for reservists who don't come to reserve duty or for young men and women who would refuse to be drafted? Do you have a, do you have a system of penalizing those people? We do. Yeah, so the answer is definitely yes. If um, a, a young Israeli of draft age um, refuses uh, to serve in any capacity, um, they can be uh, judged in a military court and sent to jail. And there are X number of Israelis who go to jail for a conscious, uh, conscientious refusal every year. In small numbers, it's not something that's that's talked about because it's not it has not been a significant uh, phenomenon. What, what the army is discussing internally now is what if, what if someone um, who's not sort of basically old and nearing um, retirement age anywhere. Um, uh, he's done 10, 15 years of reserve duty and doesn't really want to do any more uh, and says, I'm not coming anymore. Um, so does the army say, as it might have said six months ago, okay, you've done enough, thank you, move on and sort of swallow, absorb this soft refusal to continue to serve? Um, or uh, do, do army prosecutors do, a, do an investigation, do a file, refer to a military prosecutor and actually go after some of these people in order to make an example of them? And we don't know um, how this is gonna play out. There is a debate underway inside the military about uh, how to handle this. Obviously, if someone is at the height of his career, let's say an Air Force pilot, um, who's been flying an F-16 for 10 years. The Army's invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in his training. Um, he has to come fly every week, at least one day a week, in order to keep himself in, uh, you know, in, in, in high, uh, at a high training level. And he simply says, sorry, I'm not coming anymore. That hasn't happened yet. If some such person um, were to um, take a principled stance and refuse to serve, when he was at the height of career and basically owes the Air Force many more years, uh, that would pose a real dilemma. And uh, there are consultations underway between the prosecutors and the uh, and uh, the senior brass of the Army about how to handle that. We're not there yet. And hopefully we won't get there. Hopefully you won't get there. Um, your mention of the new draft class prompted a question from a listener, and I think this needs some explanation because I don't think Americans are very clear on this concept. The question was, do you think that Haredi men and women should be required to serve in the IDF? And I don't think there's a great understanding here about what that question means and who are the religious Jews, who are the Haredi Jews, who are the secular Jews, and how that shows up in military service. Could you just give us a little bit of a primer on that? Okay, I understand this call is scheduled to go on for another three hours, correct? <laughs> just you're, you're Only pushing, if you want it to. Only if you want it to. You're pushing me into one of the uh, most uh, complicated and divisive issues in Israeli society. I'll start by answering your question, the listener's question directly. Yes, I do think um, that uh, the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel, the Haredi community, um, has an obligation 
um, to do national service of one form or another, military or civilian national service in lieu of military service, uh, but we're nowhere near there. That community is nowhere close to agreeing um, to this. This remains a, um, um, an unresolved issue in Israeli society, and I do not expect this issue to be resolved anytime soon, even though we're coming to another sort of crunch point where the existing legislative rules, which are sort of allow the ultra-Orthodox to avoid military service have sort of expired or been struck down by the courts, and the government's going to have to come up with a a new formula and pass that through Supreme Court review. This brings us back to judicial reform and Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Supreme Court's ability to review and overrule and strike down uh, Israeli law. But I, I, I will, as you request, take a step back and uh, look at the issue with a, a broader, um, a broader lens. In fact, uh, today only about. 50% of 18-year-old Israelis, that's the draft age, um, actually serve in the military. Um, and that's because there are um, significant segments of the Israeli public um, that either um, have the ability to opt out or have had the ability to opt out, like the ultra-Orthodox, uh, ultra-Orthodox men and women, or um, have long been given a pass uh, from service, such as Israeli Arabs. Um, and um, there are um, significant numbers of, let's say, the upper class that have always found ways to weasel out of military service or um, serve uh, for a very short period of time in auxiliary units um, or do desk jobs. And after six months, they get a get out of jail, get out of military service pass and, and move on with their lives. So in fact, we're down to about 50% of draft age young Israelis who actually serve in the military. And maybe only about 10 or 15% of them are actually in frontline combat units. Um, there are huge numbers of Israelis who serve in important auxiliary units like military intelligence, which is in fact the large, that is the largest Israeli corps, military intelligence of all, um, in all types and all aspects that ranges everything from, um, from satellites to, uh, to core research on, on the Arab world. Uh, it's an enormous corps. Um, all the other backup units of the army, ranging from you know cooks um, to social services. That's another huge part of the military. And as I said, there are um, significant numbers of Israelis, uh, many national religious women, um, some ultra-Orthodox men, some Israeli Arabs who have the ability and opt uh, to do national service. National service can mean um, anything from being school teachers uh, to social workers um, to um, back up for um, Israeli government officials in, in offices across the government. And because there are increasing numbers of young Israelis doing this, um, the actual number of young Israelis who serve in the military, as I said, have shrunk to 50%, and, and those who are in frontline combat units are even lower. There are some who have argued, and I'm not a supporter of this, uh, that the Israeli army should move uh, wholesale to a professional army model and drop this notion of um, cross the board draft of all Israelis. That's not really true anyways. The reason why I'm opposed to this, and in fact, the Israeli army is opposed to this, is that the minute you drop the universal draft requirement, uh, the army won't have its choice pick of the best young Israelis for frontline command commando units, for military intelligence, for the Air Force, and other frontline units. Uh, the minute you move to a professional army, you may get only disadvantaged segments of Israeli society actually going to military service, no matter how much you offer. Uh, to pay them. 
Um, so I don't think Israel's going in that direction anytime soon. It would probably be a bad idea. Uh, we do have a significant problem with the ultra-Orthodox community, both in terms of its, um, by, mo by and large, unwillingness to serve in the military or national service, but even more importantly, in terms of its integration in uh, the Israeli economy uh, and getting itself educated at a level um, that we know and expect in a modern Western society, to be able to take um, high level productive jobs, not just to become truck drivers and bus drivers or insurance uh, agents, but also to become uh, engineers, uh, doctors, um, and, uh, and high tech employees. And the vast majority of the ultra Orthodox community does not receive um, sufficient enough education to propel them in that direction. Um, and that is both a real drag on the Israeli economy and a threat to Israel's long-term future. That's the bigger issue. Um, I can't say that there's real forward progress being made on that in recent years. So thank you for the deep dive. I think it's important for our listeners to understand um, both places that Israel is a very coherent society, uh, cohesive society, and places where Israel may be a little bit less cohesive. And that's very helpful. But again, I'm going to do the JPC disclaimer thing and say that I believe that the Israeli government will work through that problem and doesn't need any input from us. Although the US military might have some useful things to say about the movement from a draft to a volunteer army and why some people are looking at a draft again here for the United States. So I'm going to leave that and return us to Lebanon for a minute. Uh, we have two questions on Lebanon. Uh, one is Tony Badran, who is a very well-respected writer and Lebanese by origin, <clears throat> wrote an article in which he says the United States and Israel are on opposite sides of the Lebanon equation and have been since the maritime um, border deal that was done under then Prime Minister Lapid. He is concerned that the United States will protect Hezbollah's interests. Uh, I imagine that's pretty much a sop to Iran, which the current administration is willing to do. And Israel, at some point, as you mentioned, is likely to go out and try to defend its interests against Hezbollah. And we could end up on the other side of Israel. We, the United States, us, could end up on the other side of you guys on a really, truly important issue. Do you see the possibility of Israel taking military action in Lebanon that the U.S. will disapprove of? So I glanced briefly this morning at uh, Tony Bedren's article in Tablet Magazine, and I think he is drawing a too sharp a line um, in posing Israeli and American interests as being diametrically different um, um, in Lebanon. It is true that um, Israel and the US, the US and Canada and Europe have had different views uh, for years about how to handle the situation in Lebanon. Take, for example, the South Lebanese army, uh, which uh, the US has been propping up. Israel believes that every, every uh, piece of armament uh, that is given to the South Lebanese army basically ends up in Hezbollah's hands. There is no real South Lebanese army, just as there is no S S Lebanese government of any of any, uh, of any significance um, outside of uh, Hezbollah's um, uh, almost complete control, uh, first of Southern Lebanon and now of certainly of Central Lebanon and other parts of Lebanon as well. And if you extend kind of Hezbollah to, uh, to Iran and Syria, you've got most of, most of Lebanon under, under their thumb. Um, no, I don't think the United States is going to end up on the other side of Israel in a future conflict. Uh, um, nobody in Washington, including Mr. Biden's Washington, um, has any um, illusions about what Hezbollah is and who controls it. Israel essentially views Hezbollah as Iran's um, forward um, force um, on our northern border. And the main reason why Israel hasn't gotten into more direct conflict with Hezbollah over the last 20 years than it has is because the Iranians 
are holding Hezbollah and its gunpowder dry um, as a grand threat against Israel um, for D-Day, for the day that Israel might choose um, or decide to strike directly at Iran. And strike directly, I mean beyond all the reported clandestine operations that Israel undertakes against uh, the IRGC and the Iranian nuclear program on a regular or even nightly basis. But in the event of a direct conflict, military to military between Iran and Israel, then Hezbollah would be unleashed um, as Iran's uh, forward arm. According to various intelligence reports, Hezbollah has anywhere between 120 and 220,000 rockets and missiles, increasing numbers of them with uh, precision guided kits on them uh, that can be fired um, into Israel. And that's being held back um, as a both as a threat um, to Israel, don't you dare strike at Iran, as well as a punishing blow to Israel if Israel were to um, undertake a direct strike um, at Iran. Um, there are many things that the Israeli military can do today um, under the radar uh, in a focused and painful way um, to strike at Hezbollah as well as IRGC um, forward bases, both in Lebanon um, and Syria um, that uh, keep us just below the threshold of full scale um, army to army ground scale combat. And I suspect that we're going to see more of that in the coming weeks and months. OK, so that goes along then with this other, <clears throat> excuse me, another question. Um, we know, the United States knows, that Wagner forces are operating in Syria. We've seen them. We've killed some of them. Do you see, does Israel see any relationship between Wagner forces and Hezbollah? It's an interesting question. It's a good question. I simply don't know um, the answer um, to the question. What I can tell you, um, as you probably know, is that Israel operates um, in Lebanon and Syria um, with pinpoint accuracy based on very precise intelligence and very precise weaponry because there are Russians, um, um, Russian troops, um, particularly Russian Air Force personnel and equipment um, in uh, Syria and also in Northern Lebanon. Uh, and Israel's very careful uh, not to strike um, at Russian personnel. This, of course, relates um, to the broader question of how Israel has approached uh, the Russian uh, invasion of the Ukraine. Um, Israel has stood with the Western world in support of Ukraine and has given the Ukraine both defensive assistance in terms of early warning systems as well as humanitarian assistance, but has not and will not um, supply the Ukrainians uh, with offensive uh, uh, military weaponry uh, because of the delicacy of our relationship uh, with Russia. Russia now sits um, on our northern border. The Russian Air Force controls the airspace um, across all of northern Israel, as well as the airspace over Lebanon and Syria, uh, which requires a, a great deal of um, careful movement and even coordination between the Israeli and the Russian militaries up north. And that's not something that Israel can afford to fritter away. Ukrainians seem to have trouble understanding the concept. <clears throat> I know for a fact that President Zelensky um, understands, at least intellectually understands, Israel's uh, position. It's been explained to him time and time again by the senior most Israeli um, uh, emissaries. Um, just two months ago, um, uh, Zev Elkin and Yuli Edelstein spent many hours with Zelensky, um, all Jews in the room, <laughs> on, 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 on all sides. Um, and um, these are very senior Israelis who've had significant positions in 
Israeli intelligence and, and security field, and, and he knows exactly what Israel's concerns and calculations are, but of course he's not happy with it because he wants more weapons from everybody and everywhere he can. Um, Israel has additional concerns. Um, we're frontline Israeli systems, let's say the Iron Dome system, um, to uh, be placed on the battlefield in the Ukraine and fall into Russian hands. Uh, they could end up uh, being handed over to the Iranians. And the Iranians are deeply involved today in the Russian uh, military effort, providing Russia with uh, military drones and other technology. And uh, it could work the other way around. Um, so Israel is not going to put on the Russia-Ukrainian battlefield um, anything that uh, is whose sophistication could give away Israeli national security uh, secrets and advantages by letting it fall into enemy hands. Which will raise a question because the United States also produces Iron Dome, the, the US version of Iron Dome, uh, in coordination with Israel and under license to various things. There have been American uh, government officials who have suggested that the US can export the US version of Iron Dome to Ukraine. Um, I suspect that won't make Israel any happier than the idea of exporting the Israeli version. And I suspect you're right. Okay, good. Score one for me. Now that we've left um, the close in stuff, I, I'm going to, I looped out to Ukraine. I'm going to loop out to another country that really isn't part of the definition of this program, but let's do it anyway. Can you talk to us about the Saudi Israel? Um, I don't want to say peace deal because I don't think there is one, but Saudi Israel conversation about where they're going in the future. I know you are heavily involved in these things. Yes, and I am writing about this uh, in the coming days. And I I'll give you my bottom line right away. I think that we need to give the Saudi peace um, a chance. Um, there are many arguments being bandied about today um, in the Israeli media, the American media, against a peace deal involving uh, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and inevitably the U.S. And I think that the doubters and the naysayers, as well as those, and there are some who are actively seeking to sabotage um, a possible um, peace deal, they're wrong. Uh, they're wrong about the chances for a deal, which I think are high. Uh, they're wrong about the risks of a deal, which I think are much lower than feared. Um, and they're wrong about the worth or the value of a, a peace breakthrough, which I think is much higher than imagined. Um, and the Saudis themselves seem uh, keen on a deal. Take a look at a piece published this week in uh, the Saudi publication called Arab News by their editor-in-chief, where he basically says, uh, basically says that a, a deal is highly likely um, and that Riyadh has never been ideologically against peace with Israel. That, of course, is revisionist history, but um, someone close to the royal family is saying that openly, and he's quoting MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, who last year said that um, the kingdom, kingdom of Saudi Arabia, sees Israel as a potential ally. Now, um, to me, and I think to Israel, a um, a breakthrough, a peace breakthrough with Saudi Arabia um, would be worth a ton. Um, it would gut 120 years of uh, Arab, word, uh, Arab world ideological warfare against the Jewish return to Zion. It would deal a death blow to the uh, progressive woke uh, assault on the legitimacy of Israel, especially if this peace deal was brokered by a democratic um, president. I think it would be in a near messianic advance um, that would further cement Israel's presence in the region um, and its standing in the world. And therefore, um, I would be in favor of uh, adjustments in the Israeli government coalition and even uh, in Israeli policy um, to make this possible, not peace at any price. Um, uh, but reasonable accommodation, yes. The problem is, is that there are um, um, actors, uh, both on the ideological right in Israel and on the ideological hard left, particularly in the US, 
um, who already are seeking to actively seeking to sabotage the possibility of a Saudi Israeli American deal. On the right, they're already calling it a honey trap, or they're calling it suicidal because they fear that Israel would be expected to do all sorts of things um, like um, freeze settlements. Um, uh, declare that there will never be any annexation of Judea and Samaria um, and things like that. And on the hard left in the U.S., Tom Friedman is a um, classic example of this. Um, anything that um, boosts MBS or Netanyahu is anathema. Um, even if it's in the strategic interest of the United States, anything that sidelines um, his beloved Palestinians uh, would be anathema. Um, and anything that um, anything that doesn't uh, that that blocks the grand deal, another bad deal with Iran, of course, um, he's opposed to. There's a lot that Israel can live with. I think that Israel could even live with. Um, greater U.S. military supplies to Saudi Arabia, which is one of the things the Saudis are reportedly demanding. I think that Israel could even live with a civilian nuclear program in Saudi Arabia, which is apparently another Saudi demand, as long as it's under tight you know, U.S. supervision. Um, Israel's not going to um, tie its hands behind its back in terms of fighting Palestinian terrorism. It's not going to make um, insane territorial withdrawals uh, in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. Um, it's not going to do some of these, um, uh, it's not going to, um, I don't know, um, uh, promise not to annex Judea and Samaria forever, but Israel might, Netanyahu might rejigger his coalition um, and say that for the next five years, another five years, we won't make any grand changes in Judea and Samaria. These things are um, accommodations that might be possible. I would call them reasonable, not at the price of appeasement that would undermine Israel or strengthen Palestinian terrorists, but accommodation along the contours that I've just described uh, would be, in my mind, for Israel, a no-brainer, uh, a mega historic opportunity that can't be missed. And for what I sense is, uh, a such a deal uh, is possible. So I'm a big supporter of such a deal. Uh, my rabbi recently went to Saudi Arabia with a group of pilgrims to the site that they believe is Mount Sinai. <laughs> Very interesting series of conversations there. Um, I do wonder if the United States government will be able to back off the Palestinian uh, commitment this is an administration that was wedded as the vice president to President uh, Barack Obama. It was wedded to a Palestinian state. It remains wedded to a Palestinian state. And I'm not sure they're going off that. So, so it is conceivable to me, at least, that you could end up with Israel and Saudi Arabia knowing what they want and being able to deal with each other, but having the United States in their way. The Saudis have no great love for the Palestinians either. And when the U.S. says to Saudi Arabia, well, you have to put money in it and you have to put money in Lebanon and you have to help these people, they don't want to. So what's the possibility that Israel and Saudi Arabia um, kind of talk to each other, kind of work toward each other? And I would point out to our listeners that it was a Netanyahu government that declined to apply Israeli sovereignty to Ju Judea and Samaria when it appeared that that was going to acts the Abraham Accords, and it could conceivably uh, make such a commitment to Saudi Arabia at the moment, because there were time constraints. Could the U.S. find itself in the middle of two people who want to get along? So perhaps that is already the case. And there are some um, Israeli analysts, for example, uh, Brigadier General Yossi Cooperwasser that I mentioned earlier in this conversation, who have argued that um, Israel and Saudi Arabia can integrate more and work closer together without going into a whole hog formal peace deal. That'll wait for another day, another time, another administration. Um, and there's a lot that can advance already now without um, Washington um, 
helping or getting in the way. Um, there are those who argue, I have friends who live and work in the Gulf who have told me um, that in their mind, they know the Saudi mind, uh, that MBS will wait for a different American administration before moving forward. He has not and will not forgive President Biden for whipping and snubbing him over the past three years, and he won't give Biden a grand diplomatic win by making a regional peace deal now. Maybe that's true. I, I, I don't know. Um, but I will say this. I don't know, I personally do not know where President Biden's own mind is on this. Don't read Tom Friedman's columns um, to understand um, President Biden's mind. Um, all the things that Friedman lists, listed in his two infamous columns of this past month about all the things that Saudi Arabia and Israel must do uh, before the U.S. would support a, a deal with Saudi Arabia, that's Tom Friedman talking. That's Tom Friedman barking and trying to hem in Biden. I'm not sure that's uh, that's Netanyahu talking. He, he wrote it as if the entire column was straight from the horse's mouth, Biden's mouth. Uh, but I think the major parts of the column are not from Biden's mouth. When you read carefully between the lines, it becomes apparent that Friedman is chant less channeling Biden, and more, as I say, trying to hem Biden in to block Biden from what Tom Friedman thinks would be the mistake of an Israeli-Saudi-American um, deal. So let's let's wait and see. So I would say, as you know, that when we come to the end of a program here, I like to go out on a high note, and I always ask my um, my guests for a positive statement upon which to leave program. I think you just made a positive statement there by indicating that this is uh, Friedman channeling Friedman or Friedman channeling, as he said, in an older column, the Israel he knew. He wants back the Israel he knew, but that was, you know, it's a very long time ago. Most of the things that we all knew when we were kids aren't here anymore. Landlines, you know, tape recorders, the Jetsons. So that's actually a, a, a kind of positive thought. Do as we conclude, however, I would ask you again, um, aside from helping us understand the entire scope of what's going on in Israel, and I, I really think that's hugely important for us to have background in these things as we watch our news and we watch and we read our newspapers, do you have any other positive parting thoughts for us? It doesn't look so positive from this side. Um, indeed, um, Israel is racked by internal uh, dissension today. Um, I won't say in an unprecedented fashion because that um, ignores the past. People forget the past. People forget the riots that rocked Jerusalem um, when the right wing broke into the Knesset and when there was a dispute over accepting wartime reparations from Germany. That goes back to the 1950s. Um, and in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, Israel was rocked with uh, social dissension, the Black Panthers, uh, Ashkenazim against Sfardim, and Israel was rocked with, with dissension after the Yom Kippur War that launched Peace Now on one hand and Gush Emunim over the other. Um, so I'm not going to say this is unprecedented, but it's tough. And there's a lot of really bad um bad vibes um and i don't see the leadership at the moment on either side of the uh of the political spectrum that is driving towards a um a, a, a renewed uh, national consensus um the, the divides are are deep fortunately or unfortunately um um our enemies tend to uh, force us to regroup uh, every once in a while um, and um, recognize uh, the common, uh, the commonalities uh, that we have and the common threats that we all face. And I, um, I suspect, I hope, I fear that <laughs> uh, um, uh, that may be the case um, uh, over the coming um, year as well. I will tell you that in the meantime, um, um, we're having an excellent uh, harvest uh, season. Um, August is the beginning of the uh, 
the wine and the olive uh, harvests. Um, as I mentioned to you earlier this week, um, is the annual uh, Israel Wine Festival at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Um, I tasted outstanding wines from wineries that even close friends and followers of Israel probably never heard of, wineries like Suba and Munitz um, and Chateau Golan and Har Bracha um, and uh, Pinto. This covers the Golan, the Galilee, the Central Plains, the Judean Mountains, the Sumerian Mountains, the Negev, um, the Southern Hebron Hills. All of these are quality grape growing and wine producing areas today. Um, so there is uh, joy um, and uh, satisfaction um, in Israeli life. Um, it would be a mistake uh, for you and the other participants on this call to feel that uh, Israel is going down the drain. That's not the case. It really isn't. I, I take two things away from that. One, thank you for your assessment of Israeli society, and I don't believe it's going down the drain either. But also, it's not too early to start thinking about wine for Rosh Hashanah. And so if it's a good harvest year and there's good stuff out there, I would encourage all of our watchers and listeners and people who download this later, go find them. Go find them. Support Israel by buying stuff that you will enjoy. And I'm pretty sure David would agree with me. You will enjoy Israeli wine. And on that note, David, let me thank you again for a very wide ranging, but very important look at what's going on in Israel and the countries surrounding it and the media reports that we hear. Um, it's always important to hear from somebody who's on the ground in the place. And that's you. Thank you very much. Good night.